Let me tell you a little bit about her. She is the program coordinator at the Levine Institute for Holocaust Education at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, where she's worked since 2006. She holds a BA in English and American Literature from the University of Texas at El Paso and a Master of Arts in Comparative Literature from the University of Dallas. She was a high school English teacher for nine years in El Paso, Texas, her city of birth. And later she served as the Director of Education at Holocaust Museum Houston for six and a half years. Her interests lie in Holocaust literature, engaging new audiences and partners, and studying and disseminating information on the impact and history of the Holocaust in Spain, Latin America, and the US Latino population. She's forged relationships for the museum with organizations such as the US Department of Education, the National Archives and Records Administration, the US Department of State, museums within the Smithsonian Institution and Holocaust organizations in Latin America. Christina currently facilitates this Conference for Holocaust Education Centers that I mentioned earlier. It's called CHECK. And in this capacity, she works with over 50 Holocaust organizations from around the country, including the Birmingham Holocaust Education Center. Um, they, she provides, or through this group, they provide opportunities for centers like ours to learn about the resources at the museum. And um, they also are now working on a networking uh, solution so that we can all network with each other across the country, which is going to be a very powerful to tool. So we greatly appreciate that, Christina. Um, Christina is also part of a small team of the museum staff who is overseeing the implementation of HR 943, the Never Again Act, if you're not aware. Um, it's going to bring Holocaust education or more Holocaust education to the United States over the next five years, and they are working on how to roll that out. So welcome, Christina, and I'm going to turn the program over to you. Um, just so everyone knows, I will be running her PowerPoint from my computer, so she's going to give me directions of what to do. So Christina, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Anne, and thank you so much to our Czech partners, um, which Birmingham and the Gulf Coast Center are. Um, and I, I just, I have to smile as you were reading and, and talking about how you, you were actually, and you were one of the first people to see what I'm going to do tonight. Um, and that was in 2014. Um, I've, as Anne mentioned, I have worked at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum since the end of 2006, I actually started in December of 2006. Um, but I was a museum teacher fellow in, in the year 2000, it's hard to believe 21 years ago, um, when I was teaching literally one block away from the Rio Grande in El Paso. Um, I was a high school English teacher and I never really taught about Latin America and I wish I had. Um, being that most of my students, they were either of Mexican descent and some of them were actually coming over from Mexico to go to school in El Paso. Um, and it wasn't until I was working at the Houston Museum, at Holocaust Museum Houston, when um, I was actually challenged by members of the Latino community, of which I am a part, um, about why I wasn't working on issues related to the Latino population. And I thought that that was really a valid question. Um, and it made me start to think not about thematic connections, because I know that there are many where we can look at human rights um, issues and violations and atrocity and such. But I, I really thought, what's the deeper history of countries south of the Rio Grande, besides what we hear in popular culture and in academic culture about Nazi perpetrators going to Latin America, but they went everywhere. I mean, they came to the United States too. So to me, the bigger question and what I thought would be more challenging to look at, and, and in some regards, more, much more interesting was, what about Holocaust survivors? Because I had met some Holocaust survivors growing up who first went to Mexico before they came to the United States. Um, and I knew that probably one of the best places to start 
would be the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. And that was one of the reasons why I was, um, even though it was difficult to leave Houston, um, I thought if I wanted to really look at the records and, and delve into this history some more, that coming to work at the USHMM would provide that opportunity, and it has. Um, so what we're going to do this evening, even though it's going to be somewhat lecture style, I am going to be asking some questions of all of you to consider the documents that we're going to look at. And then you will receive um, the drawing that we're going to start out with um, and also the sequence of the lesson plan. But I do want to make one note. Uh, this lesson plan will be changing. And first of all, you will not find it on the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's website. Um, when I presented it to the Czech uh, participants in 2014, and Anne was in the first group, the Birmingham Holocaust Education Center was one of, uh, was in the very first cohort of organizations when we started the Czech program in 2014. And I was asked to present this lesson, and I did, so Anne got to see it, and then nobody saw it again <laughs> for several years. Um, very long story, but for, for various reasons, it just, it never made it to the website. Um, but people were hearing about it, so I was being asked to speak about it um, here and there in places, especially like Miami, where there's a large population that would, um, would have connections to this history um, in Texas and California, New York. Um, but What's, what we have to remember is that, first of all, Holocaust history is for everyone, and that all of the different parts of Holocaust history shouldn't just be for one audience. Um, we don't want to get into these silos where we're saying, well, you're of a particular group, so this is just for you. Um, it's like I like to tell my colleagues, if we were doing a program on the Holocaust in Hungary, we wouldn't only invite Hungarians to hear this. This is for everyone. Um, and so whether you have students who are from Latin America or of Latin American descent isn't the issue. This is to show the global impact of this history. And also what this lesson can help you do is to answer one of those questions that your students and that our visitors ask, and that is, why didn't they just leave? Why didn't European Jews leave Europe or get out um, when things started to go wrong? So this lesson helps to answer that beyond the United States. Right now we have an exhibit and an initiative called Americans in the Holocaust, and it is very strong at looking at the factors in the United States that had, that could have influenced um, our responses to the immigration crisis in the late 1930s and early 1940s. So this, this lesson with is not, as, not in as much depth, but it attempts to get at some of the elements of a handful of countries in Latin America. So that is also the other thing. Um, a lot of times when I get asked, can you talk about Latin America? I always ask, well, which countries? Um, Latin America is not one country. It's not even one continent. It's, it's actually, it's two with, <laughs> the, um, with Central America being actually part of the North, but we still refer to it as Central America. So it has a very diverse geography. It has very distinct cultures. Um, of course, with the exception of Brazil, um, most are Spanish speaking, but you can also look at places like Belize where English is the primary language. So there are a lot of different elements to think about when we think about Latin America and the Holocaust. And um, what I tried to do here was to draw from our collections. I have amazing colleagues um, in our International Archival Project that have gone around the world to work with governments and different nations to encourage them to open and, and let us have access to their records from their ministries of foreign affairs, for example, from the 1930s and 1940s, and sometimes even prior to that and even after the 1940s. 
Um, and we've been very fortunate that we have worked with Latin American countries to receive some of these records, or we have found individual organizations, Jewish communities, for example, that have um, from many of these countries that have provided records to us. And within those records, we have found some of the documents. Um, as I mentioned for several years, this lesson really just kind of stayed with me and whoever else I might have been invited by to, um, to give this talk and to give this training. Um, but now, uh, because the museum really understands that we have to adhere to our, our, um, our strategic plan, and that is to look at the global impact of the Holocaust, this lesson is now being revised. I'm currently starting to revise it and rework it and also to tie it a little more closely to what we do with the Americans in the Holocaust Initiative and some of the things that we've done there. We do have a lesson plan that looks at the challenges of, it's called the challenges of escape. Um, and it looks at the um, challenges of emigrating with an E from Germany and why that was difficult and the challenges of immigration with an I coming to the United States. Um, so this lesson can kind of be an extension of that, but it should also stand on its own because it's looking now at the global impact. So what you're going to see here today, um, there will be things that will be added to it. Um, and hopefully that will be available by the summer. Um, it's challenging to work on because most of the material is in Spanish. So we will offer translations. Um, I do read Spanish, not as quickly as I can read English, but um, I, it, it is really incredible information what we have. And a lot of the information you can find on our website and our collections page. Um, but it takes a lot of time to research. They're not things that will jump out. You have to go into an archive and a collection and, and read several hundred pages before you get to a document that really fits the purpose of, of what you would like to accomplish with this lesson. Um, so with that being said, um, I've condensed a lot of the information to where we are looking at certain factors when we study migration and migration patterns. And so for those of you who teach about these patterns and teach about migration in any time period with any particular group in any region, hopefully this will sound familiar to you so that it's not an add-on. And if you're teaching about the Holocaust, hopefully this lesson, if you decide to look at Latin America, I encourage you to not see it as an add-on is something extra, but something that's integral to understanding the parts of, of this history um, and understanding the global impact that this history had. So with that being said, I'm going to ask um, Anne to share the PowerPoint um, and to start off with this magnificent drawing. Um, this is my favorite, and you'll get a you'll get the file to this. Uh, it'll be made available to you. This is probably my favorite uh, primary source document. Um, one of them, anyway. I would say it's in, in my top three of primary source documents. Uh, this document it's it's in German, um, but it says from our old home to our new home. And I found this as a postcard when I was visiting the Jewish Museum in Berlin in, back in 2004. It had just opened the year before. And a colleague of mine at the USHMM, at the time I wasn't working in, in, in Washington, I was in Houston, but somebody at the same time from the USHMM had also been there and had seen it. Um, and the museum was able to use a copy of this. They received permission to, to use a copy of this in a book that we have published on children in the Holocaust. So it wasn't focusing on Latin America, but because of my interest, I saw it as a Latin, um, as a Latin American document. So if you look closely, and um, I don't know, Anne, if we could share the document 
um, as a file, it might be a little difficult to see, but I can point out some things to you. So the document lists a lot of dates and it starts off in 1925. Um, and the reason why it starts off in 1925, it's not when the person who drew it, it's not when this person was born, but it was his parents' um, wedding anniversary. So we're going to ask a few questions. And so if we can click on, we can click one time, one of the questions that we ask is, of course, and these are some, some DBQs, what is this? And you can respond, you can unmute and you can just respond out loud, we're a small enough group. What is this object? What do you think it is? Dominique. Um, the story of the family's um, immigration into South America, um, the places they tried and, and then were bounced around because they would not be granted asylum. Okay. So, Rio, Santos, Montevideo, and I'm guessing okay. ultimately Argentina. Okay. Um, anybody else have anything they want to add or something different? I guess the child is showing different ways they were transported uh, by train and then by boat. Okay, uh, good, good. Finally a larger boat. Mm -hmm. Good, okay. Um, so we can go to the next question if we click one more time. Who drew it? Just by the way it's drawn, I the think child. So. a child or a teenager, a teenager. How old do you think this child is? Uh, 12. Okay, 12. Yeah, we could, I mean, if we look at the dates and, and what's the last date, can anybody tell the last date? It's, it's um, late 38. 1938, 38. November, November of 38. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, who, so who drew it? So we're saying a child drew it. We don't know if it's a male or a female. Um, it has a lot of dates on it, especially 1938. So for those of us who know our history of the Holocaust, um, we know that one document cannot tell us everything about a particular history. But a document can have certain clues. And if we know, looking by se at secondary sources, what do we know about the year 1938? Well, November 1938 was Crystal Knock. Mm -hmm. October 28, 1938 was the, poli uh, the Poland Action. So the expulsion of Polish Jews out okay. of Germany. Good. Good. Um, there are many things. I mean, 1938 is, is seen as the um, turning point year. Uh, you know, we have the Anschluss, the annexation. Um, we have the Evian Conference. Um, so, you know, maybe these played a factor. This, this document doesn't tell us that. Um, if we go to the next question, if we hit one more time, how old do you think the artist is? So we said uh, teenager, 12, 13 year old. And the final date of the drawing, it's November of 1938. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can click just one more time, um, why do you think the artist drew it? Um, and we kind of touched on that earlier, but if anybody has something different they want to add. I would say that first date over here uh, in May of 25, I don't know if that's just when he, this person started the picture or if that's when they were born. Why would they choose that date that they lived at this house? And then in 38, they're living at this house, both in Berlin. Okay. So perhaps this is a birth. Okay. And if we click one more time. Okay. Um, 
and I'll fill in some of the blanks for you, but what else can we learn from this drawing? I think it's it? called... Mm -hmm. Go on, I'm sorry. Me? Yes. Okay. Um, I think it's, it's somebody, a child, a teenager, who is trying to keep track of the, the, all the moves that the family has had to make in his or her short life. It's, I feel like it's a way to make sense of the chaos that has been going on in that family for quite a few years now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Any, anybody else want to have, uh, want to add to, to what Dominique said? Because they're so precise with the dates, that's why it makes me think it may be even an older teenager. Uh, you know, I don't know if a, you know, 12 year old would be so concerned with the dates uh, the way this is. Cause it seems like with every stop, there's a date. Sure. Sure, so, so let me give you the background to this. And I think a, a, a bigger question we could ask ourselves as, as educators is how would you use it in the classroom? You know, could you use it in your classroom and, and how, for what purpose? Um, so it was a 12 year old boy, a German Jewish boy named Fritz Freudenheim. And he just writes F Freudenheim at the bottom. The first date that Anne pointed out was his parents' wedding anniversary. Uh, in 1925. And he actually begins drawing this on the actual journey that his family's taken as they have left Germany. And all of the places that he mentions are the different places where they stopped and they had to, sh and from what we know, they picked up more passengers but at each place they had to have documents to enter. Um, so the potential for something going wrong was very high here. Now, if you look at the drawing, and I was an, an English teacher, so punctuation was everything. And that had a lot to do with tone. So from our old home to our new home, exclamation point, he's writing this with a sense of excitement. You know, he's a 12 year old boy. How many 12 year olds get to travel to another two from the Northern, from Europe to the Southern hemisphere? So for him, it might've been a bit of an adventure, um, but for his parents who knew the realities and had to deal with the realities of having to leave and having to find the documentation and a, a way to get out and a place to go, it could have been very different. Um, so the drawing is a little whimsical, the way he draws um, the, the map. I, I find it fascinating. Um, it's, and I also find it very engaging because it's, he seems like a very smart boy um, to, to understand all these different places where they have to stop and to think about the continents that they, they go through. They go from Europe. Um, from Central Europe to Southern Europe to Northern Africa. And so he starts to draw it uh, as they're on their journey, but he doesn't complete the drawing until ultimately they actually end up in Montevideo in Uruguay, um, Calle Sotelo. He even gives you the street address. Um, and that's when he finishes the drawing. And he did spend the rest of his life in South America. In fact, he changed his name from Fritz to Federico, and he spent the rest of his life in Brazil. He passed away in 2009, and his family has this drawing, and I met somebody who knows the family, and they filled in the blanks for me. They were the ones who said, you know, that was the parent's anniversary. He didn't finish it until he, he was in Montevideo. Um, he didn't, he knew something was happening, but his parents kind of kept things hidden from him. Um, and for him, it, it was a bit of an adventure. He even names the, the boat. Um, when you look closely at it, you'll see the name. And they, they still have the drawing. 
Um, unfortunately, he didn't. Um, there is no testimony of his in, in the Shoah Foundation. I've already checked. Um, but the family did, um, they did fill in some of the blanks for me. And so for me, what this drawing does is, I mean, it, it can do many things, but it is a, a great start to ask those questions. Well, why Latin America? Um, you know, I thought just Nazis went there after the war. Um, and, and no, they did not. So if we go to the next slide, we can see uh, this. Some of you might be familiar. We have a couple of our museum teacher fellows here. Um, and Amy McDonald and, and Dominique Blanchet are here uh, joining us and they are very highly trained um, and active with the museum uh, as teacher leaders in Holocaust education. So it's always great to see friends um, joining programs. And this is probably something that, that you're familiar with. If you've been through museum teacher programs, we have used this map. And this is a map of Jewish immigration from Germany alone from 1933 through 1940. This doesn't include the years after 1940, of course, through 45. And it doesn't look at immigration from other countries in Europe, just the German Jewish population from this time. And if you look closely, you'll see that about 83,000 people, according to this map, went to, um, to Central and South America, Mexico, all the way down to the Southern Cone. But from what we understand, and because we have more documentation, it was probably higher than that, the numbers. So this leads to the question, why Latin America? Why certain countries? Um, we even have um, some records of refugees going to countries like Honduras. Uh, I met a survivor who lived in Honduras for the rest of his life. He just passed away about three years ago, um, but he spent all of his life there. And he went there because his mother was able to secure visas for him after he was arrested during Kristallnacht. Uh, she went to the Honduran consulate and he gave her visas. So um, there are a lot of stories here to unpack and it's a very fascinating history. So if we go to the next slide, what we want to look at are in the terms um, in, in migration studies is we want to look at the push factors in this lesson. The factors are the reasons that you want to leave a place. Um, they can be economic factors, they can be social factors, they can be political factors. Um, they could even be um, factors having to do with climate, with geography. Um, and now we're seeing more and more how genocide can be linked to geography and climate change too. That's not covered in this lesson, but it is something that to consider. So if we go to the next slide, we, we want to look at what those push factors are. Um, so what are the push factors? What are the factors that are pushing German Jews at this point, because we're looking at 1938, the drawing, um, what are some of the factors that have faced um, Jews in the Third Reich and the German Reich, which by 1938 will come to include parts of Czechoslovakia as well as Austria? So in order for your students to understand what the push factors are, we're going to watch, um, I'm gonna do a screen share now, so and you can um, stop your screen share and I'm gonna show you chapter three um, of our film, The Path to Nazi Genocide. Chapter three is called From Citizens to Outcasts. Now this is a 38 minute film you can stream it from our website, it's free. You can also watch it on our YouTube channel, but we know that many schools are restricted, so it's better to stream it from our site. Um, but we also have hard copies of it too that you can request. Um, and this particular chapter looks at those push factors, even though it doesn't call them as such. Um, so if you watch these, look carefully at what those push factors are, what is pushing German Jews out of the Third Reich. So I'm going to share my screen. And okay, can everybody see the screen? Okay, so let's go on ahead and watch.
Before the Nazis assumed power, Jews enjoyed all rights of citizenship in Germany. After 1933, the German government gradually excluded Jews from public life and public education. Newly established Jewish private schools provided a safe learning environment for some. By 1938, German authorities had isolated and segregated Germany's Jews, expelling them from the professions and eliminating most opportunities to earn a living. We felt so, uh, why can't we be part of it? Why can't we? Everybody said, Heil Hitler, like this. I did too, but did I know I was eight years old. So my mother said to me, you're not supposed to do that. I said, why not? She said, why haven't you been told that you were Jewish? I said, oh, I forgot. Germany's Jews would get plenty of reminders. Meine Herrschaften, hier ist bei Kott in jüdischen Warenhäusern. Gehen Sie doch bitte weiter. This sense of isolation that came upon us after 1933, gradual and increasing, it also affected us psychologically. We knew we were in a hostile world. Between 1933 and 1939, the German government enacted hundreds of laws to define, segregate, and impoverish German Jews. My sister and I used to slink by those, those huge banners that were all over. You're the off the video. Try not to see. You were off the video. You're also muted. The goal of Nazi propaganda was to demonize Jews and encourage Germans to see Jews as dangerous outsiders in their midst. After 1935, everyday anti-Semitism was a regular part of carnival parades and floats. Public displays of anti-Semitism reinforced a climate of hostility toward Jews in Germany, or at the least, indifference to their treatment. In March 1938, German troops moved into neighboring Austria. Germany shredded another provision of the Versailles Treaty as Hitler's homeland was incorporated into Germany. It was a disaster for Austrian Jews. Within a year, the Nazis achieved in Austria what had taken five years to carry out in Germany. On November 9th, the Nazi party orchestrated an outbreak of anti-Jewish violence throughout Greater Germany. It was a lawless onslaught that outraged the world and provoked criticism of the regime by many Germans. Jewish businesses that had already suffered anti-Semitic attacks were targeted for deliberate vandalism disguised as spontaneous public action. Party officials directed the SA, SS, and Hitler Youth to destroy Jewish shops and torch synagogues. Over 7,000 Jewish-owned businesses were vandalized. Germans named the violent attacks Kristallnacht, Night of Broken Glass, for the shattered windows of Jewish-owned stores that littered the streets. The nationwide violence damaged or destroyed more than 250 synagogues. After Kristallnacht, I remember driving through Berlin and seeing the, the, the synagogues in, in flames and all the glass on the streets and the people huddled and depressed. They walked around like the victims, like the, the hunted. German police filled the concentration camps with thousands of Jewish inmates. The SS released them only if they agreed to emigrate. 
but Jews faced increasingly restrictive immigration quotas in most countries and bureaucratic hurdles in Germany. A new law issued in October 1938 required Jews to surrender their old passports, which would be valid only after the letter J was stamped on them. Two months later, another law prevented the flight of capital owned by Jews when the economics ministry froze all Jewish property and assets. Many, who had the means and somewhere to go, tried to leave Germany. Some families sent their children alone to other, safer countries. They could not know how soon the world would be at war. Let's see, okay. I'm sorry about that. I was trying to find a file that we want to um, that we want to share with you, and it's a sequence, uh, and I have it right here. Let me just um, I had to admit I mailed it to myself. Um, I'm going to put this in the chat, or and do you have it? The file. Uh, yeah, I can download it and, and I'll I have, put it in I have it. I have it. Okay, yeah, if you can if you can attach it in the chat, that would be great because this is the sequence of, of what we're going to discuss. Um, but if we can go also, we can go back to the PowerPoint. Um, so this is the current sequence of how the lesson will go. It's going to go through some changes, as I mentioned, um, because now we format all of our lessons a certain way, but you can still use some of the documents and we will make them available to you, as Anne mentioned, on the website um, because they're not in a collected space on the USHN website. So I think Anne just uh, put the file up. No, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to it okay. right now, hold on. Okay, um, I'm gonna go, I can go to the PowerPoint, so let me, let me share. I'll do, I can do the screen share and the PowerPoint. Okay. okay, so can everybody see the PowerPoint? Okay, good. Um, so before we, before we start, um, what were some of the pushback factors? And since we're a small group, I mean, if you put them in the chat, that's fine. But since we're a small group, what are some of the push, what are some of the push factors, I should say, of, um, the film. What does it show that would be an example of pushback or push out, pushing out? Okay, I do see um, a lot of the anti-Jewish laws, the legislation. Okay, anti-Jewish laws, Nuremberg laws, for example. Mm -hmm. um, anything else? Yes, Dominique. Loss of opportunities. Um, I'm thinking educational, professional, athletic. Uh, when we think about the the, the Olympics uh, in Berlin in '36, so lack of a future for young people, for example. Yes. So for young people, um, at the same time, you see opportunities increase for non-Jewish uh, German youth and the buildup of, of German youth as part of propaganda. But at the same time, um, you see the marginalization, the increased marginalization of youth um, being forced out of schools in many cases. Um, this is also a good opportunity though to look at what they did to counter that. Um, this is a good time to also look at resistance, starting your own school, continuing, um, starting to um, prepare yourself to leave. We start to see this happen where several youth um, become Zionists and look to go to what was then um, Eretz Israel, Palestine. Um, that's a good opportunity to begin to look at that. 
Um, so the loss of, of economic opportunity and jobs. And um, I do want to note that this film, it, it's not possible to put in everything um, about this history into one film. We had to make it short for the use uh, primarily of the military audiences who it was first made for, but then also knowing that teachers have a very limited time in teaching about the Holocaust. But you can supplement this film with our Holocaust Encyclopedia articles. And we do have an article that we're gonna include in the lesson on refuge in Latin America. Um, and you can supplement it through that. But what we wanna look at here for the purposes of, of migration studies is the push factors. When people are pushed out of a country or of a society because of who they are or what they are or what they believe. Um, and that's very important, whether we're looking at the Holocaust, whether we're looking at the refugee crisis today, we're hearing more and more about what's happening on the border again, for example. What are those push factors that, that force people out or feel, make them feel that they need to leave for whatever reason? Um, so the film does show that. Um, and the lesson will address some of those examples. And you can also see, we use the same terminology in our challenges of escape lesson as well. So I'm gonna go back to the screen share. Thank you so much everybody for your contributions um, to understanding this. So we are looking at a case study of five countries um, and we hope to add more countries. Like for example, I would like to add Venezuela. We have some more information on Venezuela, but we don't have any direct records from the Venezuelan Jewish community. But, but uh, Venezuela, we've seen uh, a lot of people leave Venezuela. Uh, if we're looking at South American countries where we've seen push, it certainly happened there. And many of them have come to the United States. What what I found um, when I was doing my research about 12 years ago, when I really started to have the opportunity and I was given time to research what we have from Latin America, I found an archive, um, uh, the David Glick collection. David Glick was an American attorney from Pittsburgh and he was hired by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee or the Joint for short or JDC. Um, that had given money to help refugees go to South America. Um, he was asked to go and interview refugees who had gone to 11 countries in South America in 1938 and 1939. And he wrote a report on each of the countries that he visited to see how the funding was being used, how they were being treated, what was needed, and then ultimately to make the decision on whether the joint should continue to provide funding to bring refugees and support them in South America. Um, he ran into a lot of problems. Um, there were issues of corruption. The money that was given was not being used properly. Um, there was a lot of infighting. Many of these countries weren't really set up to bring in a lot of immigrants. And many of these countries were underdeveloped and, and lacked um, not only funds, and the funds were never sufficient enough, um, but they were also agricultural countries and they couldn't provide jobs in many cases. And they wanted agricultural workers. You see that happen a lot in some of these countries. They didn't want white collar workers, which many of the refugees were white collar workers and had come from big cities where they weren't farmers and they weren't working in agriculture. Um, but ultimately he, he made the conclusion that yes, even though there are all these challenges, the situation is starting to become more desperate and soon the war will break out to where it will really be necessary to help get more people out. But then also because of the war breaking out, they're going to run into the challenge of being able to bring people over for many different reasons, which we'll get into in a bit. So he wrote this report. Um, it's not digitized on our website, but it's in our collections. But what we do have on our website is about 40 minutes of historical film footage that he took of the refugees in South America themselves. So it's moving imagery 
there is no audio to it. It's silent, but I will narrate um, just a short clip that we're going to watch. We're only going to watch about a minute, but I will narrate and tell you um, where they are. And as we watch this, think about how different their lives are in the places where they are. The climate is different. The language is different. The people are very different. Uh, you don't have large indigenous communities, if at all, in places like Austria, Vienna, Berlin, um, Frankfurt, some of those bigger cities. Um, and now they're living with people whom they've never seen before in their lives. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, they're living in rural areas. They're living in the tropics. These are very different from where they were living in Europe. Um, they're also living in the in more desert climates and arid climates. They're living in the on the equator, which brings a lot of challenges for them, especially if they have health issues. So let's go on ahead and watch this clip. And again, there is no audio. This is in Trinidad and Tobago. And these are some of the refugees. Um, they're enjoying the water, probably cooling themselves off because this is a very hot and humid climate and it's not something that they would be used to necessarily, uh, depending on where they live. This is outside, uh, this is about 40 miles outside of Caracas, Venezuela. And you can see that they have arrived and the Venezuelan Red Cross has come to set up uh, some food and soup kitchens for them uh, to provide them for food. The, the refugees in this video, in this portion, are from a boat called the Konigstein that was denied entry in Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela took them in. This was in early 1939. Venezuela took in two boats. You can see the Venezuelan Red Cross there, these are women who are volunteers with the Venezuelan Red Cross who are trying to help the refugees. And this is a, a German Jewish refugee, the woman right there uh, hanging her clothes. Can anybody tell me where, where this is? Anybody recognize this? Ecuador. At the, yeah, the equator, right? This is the, yes, this is right at the equator. And this, look at the climate. It's arid, it's dry, you see cactus. I mean, would you see a lot of cactus in, in Vienna, for example? Probably not. Um, so again, this helps you to think. That could be what we would call a pushback factor. You know, do I wanna go someplace where the climate is gonna be so different? And if I have breathing problems or health problems, is that gonna be healthy for me? Now keep in mind, this is all prior to the war and this is prior to the final solution. Once these start to take place, then you'll go anywhere probably, but this is early on. This is, this is outside of Peru, uh, outside of um, Lima in Peru, this particular part right here. This is a, a German Jewish family. And what we don't see is the family and the life that they left behind. Um, this, you can see many of the, of the local people at the train station. This is David Glick filming as he's leaving the train station in this community outside of, of uh, Lima. Um, so we have more of this film footage on our website. And you will even see some film footage on Copacabana Beach, and you'll see the Christ the Redeemer statue in the background up in the mountain. Uh, I will send the link to the film footage, but all you have to do is go to our website, ushmm.org, and do a search of David Glick, South America, and you can see the rest of the film footage. So um, looking at that film footage, and that is a, is a start to considering um, the opportunities, but some of the challenges that the refugees will face. So one of the countries that we included in the lesson is Argentina. And these are some of the reasons why we would include Argentina, because Argentina did open its doors to Jewish immigration starting in 1880. Um, it had, at that time, the largest Jewish population in South America, 
Um, and today, Argentina has the seventh largest Jewish population in the world, about 250,000. At this time, it was 274,000. So there was active Jewish life. And if you've been to cities like Buenos Aires, it's very European. Buenos Aires is often called the Paris of South America. Um, and there was a large German-speaking population already there. There were a lot of ethnic Germans already living in Argentina and countries like Paraguay and Uruguay and Chile. Um, but at the same time, the pushback factors, these are some of the factors that would make it challenging to go there. The depression hit Argentina very hard. Um, and Argentina is, is still today has um, an unstable economy and situation. Um, and also, this was a dictatorship. It wasn't the military dictatorship that we would see later on starting in the 70s, but there was a lot of emphasis on the military and the church and very conservative uh, Catholic church faction that was very active in Argentina that had a lot of influence. So Argentina saw itself as a Catholic nation. So if you're a religious minority, it's a lot more difficult to go there. One of the things that I don't explicitly list here is that in July of 1938, Argentina issued what is called, um, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs issued what is called Directive 11. And this was around the time of the Evian Conference. Um, <coughs> and this directive basically said to ban Jewish immigration to Argentina. It was sent to all of the Argentine embassies in Europe. And this is before the war. So keep in mind, this is 1938. This is a little over a year uh, before the war, but right before Kristallnacht. So again, that raises in our minds these factors when you see after Kristallnacht, the increase in visas to leave and to go anywhere. Well, Argentina right away with Directive 11, is there's a ban there. Um, and that will be added to the new lesson. Um, but also there was a deep admiration among many conservative Argentinians for, for Nazi policies. Now, again, this is 1938 and this is before the final solution is put into place. Um, but we don't see a huge change. Now, one of the things that we wanna do in the lesson is make sure that students understand the geography of where these countries are so that they can get a sense um, of some of the difficulties. How easy is it to go from Germany to Argentina by boat or by plane? Um, so here's what we're doing with the lesson. This is what we're going to do. We will give um, about three or four primary source documents uh, for each country. And students will look at the documents and determine is this document showing pushback or is it showing pull? So this particular document is one of my favorites. If you've ever visited the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, and unfortunately we are temporarily closed, temporarily closed right now because of the pandemic, but we hope that we will open perhaps sometime in the summer, we're not sure. But if you've ever been on the fourth and third floors, you will go through the Tower of Faces from Eishishak. These are thousands of pictures of the Jewish community of Eishishak in Lithuania, a shtetl, which is, which is a, a Yiddish word um, for Jewish community. Um, and this young man was from Lithuania, from this particular town. But he was part of the immigration that Argentina encouraged um, for, for uh, Eastern European Jews to go to, to Argentina, preferably to go outside of Buenos Aires and help to establish business and commerce in cities away from the central part of Argentina. But he did end up living in Buenos Aires and he's sending this card back for Rosh Hashanah uh, to his family in Lithuania. And it's in Spanish, muchas felicidades. Um, felicidades is a word that a lot of us use to say congratulations or um, a greeting for the new year, another word. So he's showing that he's adapting to, 
the local language and the customs and we see Buenos Aires and, and this looks very peaceful. So if, if somebody were to look at this, do you think this is an example of a pull factor or a pushback factor? So you can unmute yourself if, and uh, I think Ms. Well, this everybody. looks pretty positive. Wouldn't it be a poll factor? Uh, it, it, because this is, if we go back and we look and yeah. students get this in the lesson, um, Argentina did at one point, it did want immigrants to come and it wanted to be seen as, a, as positive in accepting immigrants. So if we look though at this, this is where it gets a little more complicated, okay? This is a storefront and this store closed in Buenos Aires. This is in Buenos Aires and this store closed in solidarity after Kristallnacht. We are Catholic and we feel the pain of our Jewish brothers. Okay, now if we go back and we look at the factors, one of the pushback factors of this would be that Argentina wanted basically everybody to be Catholic. It saw itself as a Catholic nation. And yet you have Catholics here who are expressing their solidarity with the Jews in Europe who in uh, the Third Reich, who have experienced this destruction uh, in Kristallnacht. So if you were a... European Jew, if you were a German Jew, an Austrian Jew, a Czech Jew, and you were looking to get out and you saw this um, coming from Buenos Aires, what do you think this would be? Would this be a pull factor or a pushback factor? And again, there, there is really no right or wrong answer. This is, this is where you can start to discuss and students can discuss. But I'd love to hear your thoughts. I would say it's a pull factor because it's 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 showing that we have comrades in the country that feel for us and are sympathetic to our cause. Okay. Anybody have a different view or want to add to that view? And for those of you who are familiar with our exhibit, Some More Neighbors, um, this to me is an example of, um, of choices and pressures and motivations. We don't know their motivation for doing this, but I know as a Catholic myself, there are some of us who have been taught that as Catholics, you should care about the persecuted. Um, the, the minorities who are disenfranchised, who are put out, you should care for the immigrant, you should care for the refugee. Um, so this really raises more questions than it does answers, but it is what we call complicating our students' thinking. It complicates our thinking. Um, so that's why I've included it here because it's also, what could somebody do? in that time? What can, what can we do realistically to help people on the other side of the world who are being persecuted? We can't necessarily go over and fight with weapons with them, um, but what can we do from where we stand? You know, and today we have social media where people would post something like this, but this, the owner of this store chose to do something, and you can look at it through that lens as well. That's that's my interpretation of this. Yeah, topic. I mean they're 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 taking a stand. You know, they're standing up and saying we don't agree with what's what's being done to our Jewish brothers. Exactly. Can I pose a completely different view? Sure. That they are that that this message is for Jews already living in Buenos Aires, who perhaps shop at this shop and mm -hmm. they don't they are trying to appease their customers and don't want to lose their customers because maybe they're very good customers mm -hmm. and that this is a way of saying we're with you and realizes this is where you used to be from or you may still have family overseas 
but we're with you here in Buenos Aires. Yeah. It, uh, it says nuestros hermanos, and that makes me think familia. So I, I, I agree with you. Uh, uh, I think maybe these people, uh, they already know them and they support them and they want them to know that they're welcome at their store. Sure. There, there are many different ways you can interpret this. But if you are, so let's go back to the central question. If you are seeking refuge and you're considering Argentina and you saw this, what could this be pull or push back? And again, you look at all of the factors. Um, personally, it might look like pool, but then you also have to consider the bigger factors outside of this store. Is the rest of the country feeling this way? What is the mood? What is, what is the governmental stance? Um, so we don't have a lot of time, but I'm glad to see that, that this is uh, provoking some thought here. Um, and, and that's great. And, and I hope that this provokes us to look more at a country like Argentina that really has a very strong history um, when you look at, at Holocaust history. Now, this document is in Spanish and we're translating in English. But what I want to tell you is that you can see from the top, it's the documentation that you need to enter Argentina. And this was issued to the Argentinian embassies in March of 1939, and again, thinking of the timeline, what do we know that has already happened by March of 1939? And this is sent only to the embassies in Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia, the Argentinian embassies. And basically, it's very, um, very heavy fines and taxes, entry fees, you need to have sponsors, if you want to go to Argentina, you need to pay high entry fees. Um, you have to show your citizen, your um, a, a record of good conduct. It's very similar to the list that we have on what you need to come to the United States. Um, and think about what has happened by this point to Jews in the German Reich by this point. So would this be a pull factor or a pushback factor? Pushback. Probably pushback. Unless you have a lot of money and connections, which most do not by this point, um, it's very restrictive. It's very prohibitive. Um, so we're gonna move forward because I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, in fact, I think we only have 18 minutes. <laughs> So I'm just gonna go forward very, very quickly here. Um, Bolivia, uh, Bolivia, um, and what I'm gonna do is just go to the documents themselves. So Bolivia, we're going to add more um, correspondence type documents, but Bolivia took in per capita the highest amount of refugees um, than any other country in South America. Uh, even though it did not have an established, a large established Jewish population, there was a German Jewish mining magnate, Mauricio Hochschild, who um, saw this as an opportunity to help the refugees. He was friends with President Brau of Bolivia, um, and he convinced him that because of the severe losses after the Chaco War with Paraguay in 1935, that um, Bolivia had lost a lot of business. And so in his mind to bring refugees over who were very business minded, this would help um, to build up more business and create more of a, a economic infrastructure in Bolivia. And that is why the president permitted um, at first 30,000 Austrian Jews to go to Bolivia and then other Jews from Eastern Europe were able to get there if they could find a way to get there. But the other, the flip side of that was that many people went to Bolivia in the hopes that they could get to Argentina. Um, and that is what happened in many cases. Bolivia was to them a, a temporary place. They really were hoping to get to Argentina. Um, I have a very good friend. I have several friends whose families first went to Bolivia 
because really Argentina was the final place that they wanted to get to. And they, they had to go into Argentina illegally and they were pretty successful in doing so. Um, some were not and they stayed in Bolivia, but today the Bolivian population, the Jewish population is, is less than a thousand people. But at one point it was in the tens of thousands because of the refugees fleeing um, the uh, German occupied Europe. So Leo Spitzer, I just saw him the other day. Um, this is Leo. He was, this is Leo right here. Uh, his mother was seven and a half months pregnant with him when they fled and he was born in La Paz. And he provided us with all of his photos. All you have to do is go to our website, type in Leo Spitzer and you'll get a ton of photos of the family and friends in Bolivia. And the reason why I include this picture is for several reasons. Um, the contrast between the two children. Uh, but this was his first playmate, this little girl. And you can see how he's dressed, very European, well-dressed, clean, well-kept clothes. And then you see a little girl who's basically wearing clothes that are not, not so well-kept and she's barefoot. Um, and the reason why I, I include this is to show that there was a huge contrast and there was a culture shock for a lot of the Bolivian, uh, for, all, for the Jews who went to Bolivia because of the fact that um, most of them, as I mentioned earlier, they had never met people who were indigenous. Some of them even in their testimony said very racist things against the indigenous people. They were shocked by them. They were shocked by some of the, the, their customs or their lack of hygiene as they perceived it to be. Um, one man famously said in, in the book Hotel Bolivia by Leo Spitzer, um, he said, you know, when we first heard of Bolivia uh, living in Vienna, we, had never, we never knew what Bolivia was. They had to go and get an atlas and look up Bolivia. He said it would have been better if we had gone to the moon because we knew where the moon was. We could see the moon in the sky every night. We had no idea where this Bolivia was. Um, but it was very hard on people who had health problems because if, if you've been to Bolivia, and, and I went several years ago, the altitude is, <laughs> it's just, it's incredibly high up from sea level. And um, in some of the testimonies, they talk about the severe nosebleeds that they had. Um, so if you are elderly, if you have health problems, um, that could be a pushback factor. And that's one of the factors that we give here when we look back right here. Um, the climate, the geography could be problematic. And that was a consideration, but again, prior to the final solution, prior to 1941, some people said, I, I can't go there. It doesn't make any sense for me to go there. You also have to travel around the continent to get there. Um, and you first had to go to Chile, and then you took a train that they called the Judio Express, that was the nickname, to get to Bolivia. Um, but in the end, it did save lives. So um, this is a picture of the refugees going to the Altiplano in 1942. And I include this picture because the Altiplano is the highest point in Bolivia. So if you're going to go to the Altiplano, you better drink lots of water, you better be able to breathe properly. Um, so again, thinking about these pictures um, and all of these considerations and having your students think critically, taking into account all of these points of, of pull factors and pushback factors, and then for them to decide. And again, there is no right or wrong answer if they can support this. This is really about inquiry and thinking about these documents on that level with all of these factors. And also look, thinking about the bigger timeline of, of Holocaust history and what is happening in 1942. Um, Christina, um, that yes. photo of the two children, it would be interesting just to discuss how the Jews reacted to the Bolivians. And that looks very much like an, a German propaganda photo of the Aryans and the Jews. Yes. And that would, and you have a lot, you have a, you know, if you are a Jewish refugee going to a country like Bolivia, you're not seeing as a minority, as a racial minority, as you would have been in, in where you came from. You were looked at as being the, the white man, the white woman, the, 
there's no difference in their mind. Uh, and there are some interesting stories about that. There's one of my favorite books um, about Latin America and, and uh, a Holocaust survivor going there is a book called Man of Ashes. And it's by Solomon Isakovich, whose older brother was a classmate of Elie Wiesel's in Romania. And he, he passed away about, uh, I think almost 20 years ago, but he talks about how he's viewed in Ecuador as being, you know, the, almost like the colonizer, even though he's not, um, because he's white and they don't view him as being, they, they see him as having power because he's a white man living in a largely indigenous country. Um, I know, Amy, that book might be of interest to you because of your work with on Romania. Um, so it's called Man of Ashes. And I think it's still pretty easy to get. Um, so the Dominican Republic is probably the country that we might be more familiar with only because of the Evian Conference. Um, I'm just going to go through this very quickly because we don't have a lot of time. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, archives to work with, the Blumenstein family archive. Uh, this was a Viennese Jewish family, the father Franz, the mother Elsa, and the little boy Heinz. Uh, they owned a perfume factory. And so we know Vienna, we think what's going to happen in the following year in Vienna. This is 1937, the following year the Anschluss will take place. Um, we also know that the Evian Conference will take place in July of 1938. This family will be impacted by that as well. The father, Franz, is arrested during Kristallnacht and Elsa is able to secure his release from Dachau because she's able to raise enough money to pay, uh, to bribe the officials because by this point their business has been Aryanized and they don't have enough money um, to pay for it on their own. And she's, <laughs> she's able to secure um, a visa for him to go to Trinidad and Tobago on the Königstein. Well, the Königstein was that boat that was refused entry and went to Venezuela. So he ends up in Venezuela. Now, they don't have enough money to purchase um, passage on the boat for Elsa and little Heinz to go. But the father has to leave because he's already been arrested. Um, so his sister, Franz's sister, had actually gone to Cuba after the Anschluss. So he goes to Cuba with, to be with his sister. And while he's in Cuba, he's able to purchase um, passage for them to sail on the St. Louis, his wife and son. We know what happens there. And we actually have photos of that he took with his wife and son on the deck and he's on a flotilla talking to them um, from off the coast of, of um, Havana. And Elsa and little Heinz are sent to the Netherlands, but in the following year, the Netherlands is occupied by Germany. They become enemy aliens. They have to go into hiding and at one point, Elsa realizes that the situation is going to become more dangerous. And she decides that she and her little boy have to separate because she figures one of them will, they will be caught. And it's better if one of them is hiding somewhere else. And she's absolutely right. She is discovered and she's able to shove him in a closet um, at one point and she's taken away. Uh, she's released, and he's never discovered um, by the perpetrators, but she is discovered again. She's sent to Westerbork, and she dies in Auschwitz. He is hidden by a Christian family, um, and in the meantime, Franz goes to the Dominican Republic, to Sosua. Um, and what we know about the Dominican Republic, a pull factor would be that uh, Trujillo, through his son, who he sent to the Evian Conference, promised to take in 100,000 refugees. Uh, in the end, less than 5,000 visas were issued by the DR. Franz is able to get visas for his wife and son to join him in the DR. But because by that point, with the, consul the consulates closing, 
by 1941, they're not able to get their exit visas and they're not able to get the visas to them. And that is why they are trapped in the Netherlands. Um, so Elsa does not survive Auschwitz, but little, little Heinz survives in hiding with a Christian family, the Dijkstra family. Um, they're given, he's given a Christian identity. They, they're very loving and warm to him. And in 1946, he and his father are reunited in the United States. Um, and he changes his name to Henry. And he just passed away, sadly, last week, a little boy. And that kind of broke my heart because I had been wanting to meet him um, because I'm doing a lot with, with this collection right now. Um, but we do have this treasure trove of letters between Franz and his wife. Um, and all the documentation from the State Department and DORSA, which was the Dominican uh, Settlement Association that was set up to help bring refugees over to the Dominican Republic. Um, and this is a picture of some of the children who were born to the refugees in Sosua. And some of these children were products of, of mixed marriages because me it was mostly men who first came over. Um, among the refugees. And many of the men ended up marrying local women and starting families with them. And today in Sosua, there is a museum to this history. Uh, Mexico, I, I just, because we're not gonna have time to get to Uruguay, but um, Mexico is the only democracy, um, the only, has the only democratically elected government of Latin American countries at this time. Uh, Mexico tended to be very liberal. Um, it tended to be uh, more um, sympathetic to, to socialists and Spanish Republicans. It had a very liberal immigration policy until the 1920s. Um, but it's still, Mexico wanted to take in people who were fighting for democratic causes in Europe. Uh, translation, Spanish Republicans mostly. Um, but as we know, many German and Austrian Jews fled their countries in the 1930s and went to Spain to fight alongside the Spanish Republicans. There's a lot of intersection between the Spanish Civil War and, and um, Germany. And I, I hope that, that we start to look at that some more. Um, so many German and Austrian Jews were able to secure visas as Spanish Republicans to go over to Mexico. Mexico, though, had its own kind of nationalistic racial view of who they wanted to come to Mexico. Mexico wanted to build up its mestizo identity after um, the Mexican Revolution. And so they were more inclined to want to accept people who were more culturally like them, who were more Latin, who spoke Spanish, and that's why Spanish Republicans were, were very much desired. Plus, they shared a lot of the same political leanings. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about Gilberto Vosquez that much because we're going to change the, um, the lesson, but... This document was issued by Gilberto Bosquez. He was a Mexican consul general. He was posted in Marseille. He did issue thousands, tens of thousands of visas to Mexican, um, to German and Austrian Jews who were able to uh, either get to Marseille or who were already there because they had fled to France after the Civil War. So this young man, you can see Vosquez's signature at the bottom, Nicholas Bodek, um, he is given this immigration card and he is able to go to Mexico. But if you look closely at the date, this is rather stunning because this is in November of 1941. And by this time, the consular offices have closed, but Marseille, was part of the Vichy government. So it wasn't considered occupied, even though it was you know, very collaborationist. And Marseille still had diplomatic relations with Mexico. So that is how he was able to get this from Vosquez. Vosquez ended up being arrested and put under house arrest for a year by Germany for what he was doing. Um, the Mexican government did negotiate to have him released. This is Vosquez arriving in Mexico City. These are many of the refugees who he helped uh, to give visas to, greeting him. 
Um, but what we want to look at is this document. This will stay in the lesson. So would this document be an example of pull or push back? And we can't really answer that because we didn't go through all of this. But if students look at the pull factors and the pushback factors that you'll get in the lesson, they can decide if this is an example of pull or pushback. Um, so on that note, we're not going to have time to get to Uruguay, uh, but that would be the fifth country. So in the lesson, you would put students in groups and each group would have a packet of documents on a country and they would look at the pushback factors and the pull factors and discuss each of the documents if they are an example of pushback or pull. And then they would decide either as a group or separately if that is a country that they would want to go to or they would not. Um, and so there'll be more to the lesson than that, but you have the current um, sequence of the lesson as it is now. You'll get all of these documents. Um, I know we rushed through this very, very quickly toward the end, um, but if anybody has any questions, I would, I would love to hear them. I don't have a question. I would just like to say that I love the way this is set up as far as um, having students, you know, that's a really different concept to have them say, is this a push or a pull factor? I mean, that is a really cool way to get them to think about this issue. So I, I really love this lesson. Well, thank you. It's thank you. Um, <laughs> I really I mean, do. There's, there's more to it when you see the sequence and the questions, which you, um, I think Anne put it, the file in the chat. And um, you'll also have it, Anne's gonna include it on the website so everybody can access that with the documents. And what's also included with the documents is the background information on the document itself. So the students are not just getting the document, but the, each document will come with an explanation. So there's, there's just so many different layers here, but, but what you look at, what some of these countries have in common, like Bolivia, the Dominican Republic, is that they're not, they're very agricultural leaning. They're not very established. They're, um, they're not very European, like an Argentina would be. Um, and, and that's, those are challenges, but those are also opportunities to go there. And um, what would you need to go there? So I hope that this expands people's understanding of, of the global nature of the Holocaust. And also to look at, again, the difficulties of, of leaving, you know, what, what the difficulties were in leaving Germany, which we have a lesson on that, but what are the difficulties in going to these countries? I was asked to give a, a full lecture on Latin America, which I did for, for you all, but I did one um, in Miami and I'll be doing the same lecture for Bristol Community College this Monday um, evening. Um, and I, um, they wanted me to call it safe haven. They wanted to call the lecture safe haven. And I said, no, you can't say that. I said, because that, that's making it sound like Latin America was the great rescuing continent and a half. And it, it had the same challenges as coming to the United States. We're not saying that Latin America rescued people. It, it faced the same, people faced the same obstacles trying to go there as they did trying to come here. Or at least they had the same level and the same number of obstacles. Maybe not the exact same obstacles, but there were obstacles. And but yet it's quite stunning that um, that some of these countries like Bolivia did what they did um, because of certain individuals. And again, what was the motivation for them to go there? And what was the motivation for Bolivia to accept them? The same with, with Mexico, what was the motivation there? Um, and if you look at the factors, which you'll get all of them, you'll, you can have the PowerPoint, that's fine. Um, you'll see all of those factors. 
Are there any other questions or comments? I was going to say there's some comments. Um, Robert said that he he teaches the push and pull factors in his AP Human Geography class, and that he loved the um, the way it has students do this analysis. And then Chelsea added that the the fact that this is incorporates the historic timeline as well, which is very interesting, using the primary sources and, and making students they're forced to look at the timeline and where does this primary resource sit on the timeline? So what was going on at the time of this particular resource? So that was very positive. Thank you. Yeah, so we will be pairing the timeline, which I know Dominique and Amy know quite well. Um, we will be pairing it with this lesson. And then you look at all of the other factors. The timeline activity is on our website. So um, yes, and Marianne, thank you for what you wrote because I do wanna say that when I did have teachers uh, test this and one of our museum teacher fellows, uh, Lori Schaefer in North Carolina did this with her students. And she said, this, this is a lesson that really builds cultural competency. If you're looking at ESL classes, ELL classes, um, she said that her students who were ELL, um, they were English language learners, it gave them a, first of all, she said it gave them a sense of pride to see positive things about their countries, like Mexico, for example. You hear so many negative things. And it, it let them be the teachers of their class to where students were asking them questions about Mexico. And her students who were not ELL learners, but who were more of the quote unquote mainstream learner, and I, and I you know, hesitate to even use that phrase, but she said that they said, wow, this is the first time that we've heard positive things about some of these countries. And now that some of them even said they had more respect for what their fellow students go through to try to get to the United States. Um, and I, um, I, I, I think that there's a lot of potential here for this lesson to really bring students to an understanding of what their fellow students go through. And, and this is just an irony that I see in my job. Um, a lot of times we struggle with how are our students gonna react to a lesson about refuge and seeking refuge? And they're not gonna get it. They're not gonna understand because of who they are and where they live. The students who get it were like the students that I taught who were coming from Mexico, who, had, who knew the struggle of getting the paperwork, having the money, hiring attorneys, dealing with the changes in immigration law. They're the ones who, who will, will understand this. They're the ones who will probably be more deeply engaged than students who've never really had to think about these issues personally. Um, and so if this lesson, it wasn't intended to build understanding and, and um, have more respect, but if that is an outcome of this lesson and nothing else is, then, then I will be very happy to see that, to see that kind of understanding. Um, so I, I think that it, it, it builds agency for our students who sometimes feel like there is no agency and no connection for them. Um, and I would love to hear how it works. If you all would, would be in touch, um, you can email Anne, but you can email me directly um, because I, I just feel very strongly that we, we, need to, um, we need to have that with our students. So any other questions or comments? I was gonna say, Christina's email is on the PowerPoint and I shared the link to the resource page on the chat. Um, I also will let you know that Christina spoke to Birmingham, the community about the Dominican Republic in more detail. And the video of that talk is on our Vimeo page. So if you want more information on the Dominican Republic, that is there as well. Um, I also will add that we are having a Yomashoa program for the entire state online on Sunday, April 11th at two o'clock. So check our website if you would like to attend that as well. Um, and because we are kind of over, I hate to rush everybody out, but I hate to keep anyone over unless somebody else has an urgent question. 
But we so appreciate you coming. I do think there's going to be an evaluation coming to you afterwards. I have to do all the business stuff. Um, so we hope you'll fill that out as well. And Christina, thank you so much. Um, um, we do appreciate it. My pleasure. And it's, it's always so great. I do have one quick question. So my family, and I, I brought this up before to you, but I had family that did go to Argentina. And the reason they went to Argentina was because if you had a first class ticket, you did not have to have a visa. Is that going to be in this lesson in any way? That was only in a few cases and that only lasted for a short time. And what that was meant to do was to weed out, to basically say to people who they knew were losing means to get there was, we only want you if you have money. <clears throat> and very Can few you people did. Yes. Uh -huh. Could you please could you please give me the time frame for that um, law that um, if you could get the first class ticket when was that? That you know, started that the... started in uh, 1936. Okay. It started, but it really wasn't enforced until 38 when you start to see the the visa applications uh, increase. Okay, so they stopped it in 38. It's just and by 38, they had outlawed, yes, okay. they had outlawed immigration. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Okay, everybody. Thank you. And Thank good night. you. So good to see you all. Thank you. Take Bye, care. Everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.